So how we are going to deliver the questions, um, Thomas and I will take turns and Mandy, Bree, you can flip a coin, whoever wants to go first, or we can kind of go back and forth or just let it be organic and just kind of let it happen naturally. So the first question that we would like to know from each of you is what does advocacy mean to you and your loved ones? I, this is Bree. I guess I, um, for me, advocacy means to me, um, what advocacy means to me is to be the voice for individuals who feel or who are unheard. Um, and for my loved one, I have a, you know, a son who experiences autism and advocacy for him means that I am going to speak up for him and I am going to um, speak towards what he needs, what he wants, what he values, and ensure that um, his needs and his wants are communicated to school, to his providers. You know, if he's not happy with something, I'm going to be that voice to say, hey, this isn't working. Let's do something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be two, two sides of a role you're playing there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, um, advocate, advocacy is a lot of what Brianna said, that, um, but it's also changed over the years. So advocacy um, was being the voice um, when my child was young, and now it's making sure that she's heard um, and that people ask her instead of looking at me to answer for her, um, and just... Um, really creating uh, an opportunity to educate uh, other people who, um, who might not know about uh, advocacy and, you know, asking the individual instead of um, their parent, even though they're an adult at that point or, or what have you. So um, it's also about um, teaching self-advocacy to, um, to youth and to, to, uh, to children to grow up to learn that I think is really important as well. Mm -hmm. Good, good points. Mandy, speaking to the part of when, when did you notice or when did you feel that it was important for your child as she's starting to get older to really take on some of that role and that responsibility? It was it just a natural progression or did you have feedback from other parents? So um, <clears throat> with, with my daughter's um, disability, she has a rare ge genetic condition that we only learned about when she was 13. So we grew up, she grew up um, and we had her growing up thinking that deafness was the only disability. Um, so she was taught at an early age how to advocate for herself. That was um, taught through the school and taught um, through myself and various organizations uh, about how to advocate as far as uh, needing an interpreter, things like that. Um, but as, as far as, um, as advocating um, I think it's still something she's she's learning to fully do. Uh, I think she's really good at advocating for certain things, um, and then other ways uh, she still needs some support in doing that. Or um, me, not me s saying for her, but still um, some coaching or guidance or asking um, kind of what would you do type of a thing. And you know that might not. Be different from typical um, young adults still asking their parents for advice or or you know questioning or not knowing how to do things she's 20 so she's kind of still coming into her own as an adult so mm -hmm. did that answer your question though yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> thoroughly thank you how old is your son um he just turned 12. Well, mm -hmm. okay. so we're kind of right at that cusp of um, teaching him self-advocacy and where, you know, um, when is it, you know, when to get him engaged in his IEP planning and his treatment plan, um, his plan of care, 
it's definitely, you know, I feel like we're at that cusp in terms of um, how much is too much um, and what's the right amount in terms of not overloading him, but also mm -hmm. having him feel empowered. Mm -hmm. So you kind of answered the question already, but I'll ask you again so everyone can hear it. Um, how would you say that self-advocacy is differs than like advocating on behalf of a loved one? Um, self-advocacy for me, I think um, it's the ability to know your strengths, know your areas of need, you know, um, identify what are your future goals and being able to identify those things and then take that knowledge of yourself and um, effectively communicate that, um, you know, being able to communicate what your needs are, what your wants are, um, how to effectively and productively argue those, um, those points as well. Mm -hmm. And then also realizing, um, you know, you can't get everything that you want. Mm -hmm. So where's the common ground? Where, you know, what are areas um, for needs, wants, desires that you can negotiate and compromise on? Mm -hmm. um, advocating on behalf of a loved one, I think it's still, um, it's, it's different in terms of you have to know that individual. Um, you need to know the person that you're advocating for. You need to have conversations with them. You may be the advocate, but you don't get to call the shots. This is someone else's life. Like yeah. you need to tell them or not tell them, but you need to have conversations, ask them like, what do you want different? What do you want from this? What are your goals? What are your desires? What do you want life to look like a year from now, three years from now? If we can't get exactly what it is you're looking for, then what is something that you can live with? What's something where you're still getting those needs and wants met, but also, you know, you may have to work a little harder on trying to get the rest of the, you know, whatever is not captured at that moment then you know kind of come up with a, <clears throat> a game plan in terms of how am i going to get these other areas fulfilled mm -hmm. and i'm sure it's a fine line of like what you said it's this is what what the treatment team or the family this is what we really want for goals and this is really what we want to strive for and and maybe your loved one your son's like yeah nope I don't want to buy into that. So it's, you know, I'm sure it's, it's, it's a balance that you have to play as a parent working with a treatment team and, and these levels of professionals and, you know, here's your loved one who may not totally understand, well, this is really what you need. Mm -hmm. You yeah. may not see it now, but. Mm -hmm. uh, I have those conversations with my son almost every week. Mm -hmm. Right now he's really upset. Um, school's over, but we're still having him do an hour of academic every day with his, um, you know, with his uh, provider agency. And he is not happy about that. He does not want to do work. He doesn't, you know, school's over. I don't, you know, he didn't qualify for ESY this year, which was the first year ever. Wow. Um, he was really excited. Yeah. So he, you know, he feels like it's a bit of a, a slap in the face that he now has to do, you know, um, academic work for an hour, but it's just um, trying to explain to him, it's an hour. Um, it's not going to be three hours, three times a week, like ESY was. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, this is to make sure that when school starts, you're right at where you were when we ended the school year, you know, you can pick up where we left off. Um, and so it's having those kinds of conversations, even though he may not agree with it, you know, trying to explain the why I think is really important. Yeah. Well, if you need some help, I would love to talk to him because I, three of my children had it every summer. Oh, mom, I have to do what for an hour? Yep. I have to do math? Oh, mom. So, yeah. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> and Mandy, if I can ask kind of, the same question, just maybe in a different way. Um, at what age was your daughter when you really started noticing her kind of begin to advocate for herself more? Um, probably um, middle school is when it was emerging, um, but high school, most definitely, um, <laughs> especially when um, when her teachers uh, who maybe didn't remember she had an IEP 
um, <laughs> didn't remember her accommodations. And so, you know, um, she would come home and be mad about it. And I said, you know, well, you need, you can remind them. I said, I can do that, but it's good for you to, to say something to them, you know, in private and let them know that, you know, that you do have an IEP and these are your accommodations for it. Um, and I mean, just making sure that she understands the reasoning behind those. Um, but I, I also agree uh, with Brianna, it is, it's a very, very fine line. And I'm finding that out very quickly uh, with my 20 year old, um, because what I want for her is very different from what she wants from her for her life and um, she's self-advocating and um, and I've I've raised her to really um, to advocate for herself and um, it's it's hard when you know when your idea of a good idea and her idea of, of wanting to do something don't align so um, and again that's just part of being a young adult probably, but um, and so it's hard to separate uh, the disability sometimes with just what's, what's typical. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say that definitely middle school was starting to see it more, but high school um, and then especially in college, she did had to do everything basically on her own. Um, and still comes to me for advice, but um, it's it's all on her now. So, Bree, you talked a little bit about this with the first question. It, it this one talked about what is the difference between being a parent and an advocate. So, you talked about here was like the professional side, but then here's the the parenting side. So, can you speak to like? You know what? It, what is the difference between being a parent versus being an advocate? Um, I mean, I think I think they're you know one and the same. Mm -hmm. I think there's a difference though in terms of informal and formal advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, informal advocacy would be um, uh, parents, teachers, friends, loved ones. Um, you know, you're not. You're not getting paid to advocate on behalf of the individual. You you have not had extensive, um, you know, legal training, I think, but mm -hmm. you still know the individual. You know them very well. Mm -hmm. um, you're able to be a support for them. They feel like they can trust you um, and they can trust that you are going to support them and to express and communicate what your needs, wants, and desires are. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of... I, I guess I, I, I struggle, um, personally, I struggle with the difference between what a parent and an advocate are because um, I am a parent advocate, but then I've also had that, um, that legal advocacy training. And that was something that um, for me um, is hard to differentiate. What, what is my advocate, my parent advocate hat versus what is my trained legal advocate hat where I'm going to start, you know, spilling, um, state statutes and regulations to yeah. um, providers. You know, there is a fine line in terms of um, how far I act in terms of my advocacy for, um, for my child. Quite a balancing act, I can only imagine. Yes. You know, and Mandy, with you being in, again, here's a professional role, how, how have you been able to balance that out? So, um, I mean, I take all my experience um, and use that as an advocate in what I do professionally. Um, but I must say that um, when it came to my own child's IEP, even her last IEP, um, it was still very different to advocate for your own child versus advocating for someone else's. Um, there's that... Um, not that there's the lack of emotion, but there's a separation um, of that, that you're, you do want to do what's best, but um, for the most part, um, 
you're able to remove the emotion out of it for advocacy and just stick to kind of facts and factual things. Um, and because being a parent, you're going to be emotional about your child and um, and advocating on their behalf. I also think that the advocacy role um, is maybe not only for that for one specific person, but groups of people or um, targeted pe groups or individuals. Uh, but um, <sighs> I don't know. I, I think that um, it's it's very different for me. And there are times in certain aspects to where I do have to change my hats and say, okay, I'm speaking as a parent right now and fully, um, you know, state that. And, um, and then there's times when I'm strictly just the advocate and, um, and able to use my personal experience, but also, you know, my training in in my advocacy work for special education as well. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you both. All right, so next question, I'll ask you, Bree. Um, in this whole advocacy scenario here that we're talking about, what were some barriers that you have encountered and kind of how did you work your way through them? Gosh, barriers. Um, <clears throat> I think getting buy-in from others. Um, as a parent advocate, sometimes I feel like I would run, a, you know, come across professionals who, because I was not um, a professional within that field, um, they thought their ideas may be, you know, um, more effective or um you know they they weren't necessarily willing to listen to what what input or what suggestions or what i had to contribute um and that i think was my biggest barrier um especially with regard to um ieps um especially behavior plans um you know my son has um you know he it, he experienced a lot of um, physical aggression and he you know, was restrained a lot. He was secluded a lot, you know, um, and it's really difficult in those situations when you have, um, you know, an individual who has very acute behavioral needs on what's the right thing to do um, and trying to, um, you know, I think there are sometimes disconnections with, within our system, you know, having community agencies communicating with the school district, the school district, you know, everyone working together and sharing all the information that works, what isn't working. Um, and that was, I think, my biggest barrier with, um, with my son was getting everyone to be on the same page and to implement um, interventions and behavior plans um, that were the same across all environments. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that didn't happen with my son until, you know, the probably end of his fourth grade year. But I will say that, you know, in fourth grade, he was restrained and secluded at least 60 times. Um, once we got that behavior plan in place that we had been utilizing as a family, his community agencies had been utilizing, once we got the school on board, Restraints went down, seclusion went down. He no longer was <clears throat> suspended. Like, oh my goodness, talk about suspensions. Um, <laughs> he was suspended quite a bit. Um, all of that drastically reduced within that first quarter of implementing it, it wasn't happening anymore. He was able then to start engaging and in going into the general ed classroom um, with no special education support for the majority of his school day. Um, so he went from a uh, you know, an SBBS self-contained classroom with four other kids and six adults to then going into the general ed classroom with 30 other kids. And he has a TA that will maybe come by, check in. You need help? Are you doing okay? All right. They go about their day. Um, so it's, it can be frustrating. It can be um, really emotional, but it's really important to just keep it, um, keep that goal in sight and keep pushing and try and find other ways to, um, to effectively, you know, 
communicate, hey, this is really working. You know, find your, you know, your support groups, have them advocate with you. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have more people that have bought into it and can express, hey, this works, you know, um, it helps move things along. And then Mandy, the same question for you. Um, what are some barriers you've seen your daughter run into? Um, well, I think one of the main ones growing up is that people had certain expectations uh, because of a label or the disability itself. And then um, thinking they knew exactly what that looked like. Um, and that was both in society or, um, or in the school setting, like um, in society, you know, people, because she's, she's deaf, uh, she also has cochlear implants, uses sign language, but she can talk very well. And so um, people would assume she could do things like read lips or, or do things. So I think those assumptions are a huge barrier. Um, and then in school, um, people not giving high enough expectations maybe, um, and giving that room for growth because some people, you know, didn't think that someone is, can be in special education and then take, you know, advanced classes or, you know, be on the honor roll. And it's, it's like, yes, both can happen. They're not mutually exclusive. So, um, and making sure that people recognize that and not just in her, but in, in other students as well. So I think it's, um, making sure that people, um, just like, you know, if you know one person who experiences autism, you know one person. And I think that's very true for all disabilities, really, is um, not to generalize things, to really, and I do it too, and you got to check yourself, um, because you shouldn't assume that, that um, any one group of people um, have certain characteristics or only experience certain things or, you know, can't do certain things or the other. So I think that's a huge barrier. Most definitely. Well, I'm sure both of you are going to have a lot to speak to this next question. So what has been or would have been helpful to know when advocating for the needs with schools <laughs> the medical providers. Oh, here's a good one. Family and friends. Looking back. <laughs> you want to roll with this question first, Mandy? Sure. So um, it would have been helpful to know um, just what um, um, I guess what expectations were um, for each of these um, systems, I guess. And um, it would have been helpful just from the get-go to uh, realize uh, and know in myself um, that just because they have degrees doesn't make them um, smarter than me about my child and um, and advocating for for the needs because um, it's it's been uh, a long hard road with uh, with my daughter and she was uh, premature and had many medical issues when she was young so um, really having to quickly find my voice as a young uh, new parent with a special, a special needs infant, um, you know, I had to fire a couple medical providers right off the bat and, um, and, and go to different ones because they would not listen to me. And, um, and just really um, trusting myself and, and what, um, what I knew about, about my child. Um, for family and friends, oh my gosh, that, you know, it can be very, very isolating having a, a child who experiences special needs. And um, I'll say that even as an adult, um, because they, they just do not understand. 
um, the amount of extra time it can take, um, the different accommodations needed, how um, how you want everything to be to be as normal as possible, but that it's still going to look different. And um, just to have uh, understanding or empathy in that, um, it's been very hard for me to find. So um, it's basically been family members who, who have been helpful. So um, just knowing, I guess, um, to trust yourself and, um, and to just keep advocating for what you think is, is right for your child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. What about you, Bree? Um, I think what would have been helpful for me to know, especially in the beginning, um, you know, Mandy touched on this, it's expectations. For me, um, you know, and you know, people describe waiver services and how they're supposed to work and what it's supposed to look like, but I think sometimes, especially professionals, um, we have a high, high expectation of what this is supposed to look like, but in reality, it is not, um, it doesn't look that way. Mm -hmm. um, and the types of services, the amounts of support, the parent training, like all these things that you kind of, um, you know, have these expectations for may not meet what you had, um, you know, what you what you thought or ex expected or assumed. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is where you can run into conflict with agencies, with providers, where you feel like they're not doing um, or providing the service that, um, you know, you've been described. And so it's really important to, I think, um, have conversations with your agencies, with your providers, with your care coordinator in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, this is the need that, that I have and my son has. Um, and this is all we're seeing, you know, this is all I can manage to accumulate for him. You know, do I have too high of expectations or am I just not looking or, um, you know, am I looking at the wrong agencies or systems to meet that need? And so I think that was something that I had um, a bit of a hard time with, especially. Um, you know, I confused waiver services with complex behavior collaborative. The two go hand in hand, um, but you're not going to receive the same intense level of support from just the waiver as you would with complex behavior collaborative. Um, in terms of like family and friends, um, it's really isolating. Having a child who experiences a significant disability and who is, you know, um, very physically aggressive and melts down and, um, and it doesn't matter, he, you know, where we are, who we're with, um, those meltdowns can last, you know, hours at times. And so um, my experience was, you know, people kept telling me, I need to, I need to spank him more, mm -hmm. you know, I need to spank him more. So that way he stops hitting. And I'm like, it, 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 that doesn't make sense to me. Um, having, um, we have ABA support and ABA has been instrumental in um, reducing a lot of the challenging behaviors. However, ABA and implementing a behavior plan can seem really counterintuitive to people. Mm -hmm. It is not, um, sometimes, you know, especially individuals who are kind of grown up with that old school, do as I say, you know, you know I'm going to give you something to cry about. Um, I was raised that way. My mom is like that. And so I will say, um, I've had a difficult time in terms of advocating for my son in terms of, you know, when he's doing this, you need to do this instead of this. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to change some of those ingrained um, pairing styles, I think is really difficult um, with friends. I don't, I mean, even to this day, that's that's an area that I really need to um, to venture out and and build because when you have um, when you have a child that's um, you know experiencing difficult times often, um, <clears throat> there's a lack of empathy. 
um, individuals don't want to be around that or they don't want their children around around that and so um, it's been very very isolating and for me um, I didn't have a lot of I didn't have um, a lot of social supports my supports were concrete supports their providers mm -hmm. um, and while that's helpful you can't talk to your DSP about like, you know, how you're feeling emotionally <laughs> and get emotional support from those staff members. Yeah. Um, and that I think kind of leads into like self-care has been a, something advocating for what my needs are. Mm -hmm. I am so focused on advocating for my son and making sure that he is supported. Um, I learned the hard way that you can't give if what you don't have, you mm -hmm. know, so you really need to make sure that like, it's not selfish for you to say, mom, you know, I need to get out of the house at least once a week for an hour and a half. You know, hey partner, can you, you know, I need you to step up and watch the kids so that way I can go do something that um, fills my bucket. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's been, I think my biggest barrier is letting go of some of that nurturing mm -hmm. so I can nurture myself. Mm -hmm. Well, then you also think about well, here's this, the, the tile that you really have to make sure that they have all these needs met. But a lot of times there could be more children in the home and they're going to have other needs. And then, like you said, oh, then there's a partner. So now I have to understand and, and meet some of your needs. And so I, I'm really glad that you brought up about the self-care and, and this, is, this is what I need to be able to continue to be able to be the support and, and provide everything for my child. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's key. So this last question, I Oh wait, Mandy had oh, something. No, sorry. sorry. I just okay. wanted to say um, that I'm also a sibling as well. So growing up, um, definitely my older brother, um, uh, I, learned what not to do very quickly um, and because he got in trouble a whole lot um, and so I knew growing up um, a, a little bit about disabilities and and all that um, but I can say as a sibling to um, that it is also very isolating and frustrating at times to be that other sibling uh, who feels like um, you're left out or the other one's getting all this attention and it's, you know, needed attention. Yes, it very much is. But to also um, know as also providers to check in and say, oh, how is, you know, whatever the other sibling or so-and-so's sister or brother, how are they doing? And do you need supports for them? And sometimes it, parents don't even think about it because they're so hyper-focused on what's right in front of them that this one need that they they may not realize it um so i'll just say that and um we can go on to the next question <laughs> oh, thank Sorry. you great right, add on i was going to say this last question if you guys don't mind maybe we can all answer it because it applies to kind of parents advocates professionals um and that's just kind of what can stone soup group provide to better assist advocates and then kind of what type of advocacy training do advocates need? So I'll, I'll give you guys my answer. I think for me, when helping someone that comes in that's advocating for themselves, the best thing that I can do is give them the resources, give them the guidance, but you know, let them do it themselves and kind of encourage them to do it themselves and say, look, if you, if you go to this agency or if you call this place and you don't find out what you need, call me back, come back, I'll be glad to, to help with kind of A, B, and C, but really kind of just giving them the tools and it's kind of like teaching a kid to learn how to ride a bike. You know, you can you can hold them and give them a boost, but sometimes they got to start pedaling those pedals themselves and steering it themselves. So I think just to for me to continue to encourage people mm -hmm. that you can do this yourself, you know, and, and don't focus on what could go wrong, but focus on all the things that can go right, mm -hmm. you know. So that's kind of my answer. Yeah, I'll... I'll uh, piggyback off of what you said. It's talking with people and sitting down and having open discussion about here's, here's what they might need, not only for themselves, but then for their family. So we're looking at, 
it could be a whole variety of needs and we might need to go in a lot of different directions but it's also important to really narrow that down because there could be a lot going on with families and they could be in crisis mode so i found it very important to really identify what what's the primary need what can we do right here right now to provide that support but letting them know here's going to be a plan i'm going to be a point of contact for you so letting them know that they're not going in a direction starting something to where they're going to be by themselves and when we look at systems and we look at these services home community-based services oh my gosh <laughs> here's a process and it, how long is it going to take so it's also about we talk about these concrete supports but what are what are the natural supports and and i also like to focus on what are you doing for you and, and, and having just an open conversation and, and really trying to, to put them at ease. And um, it's, it's, again, it's not just like what you were talking about, Mandy, not, it's not just this individualized person. It's, it's, it's a family unit and there can be, a, there can be a lot that needs to be addressed. So um, the ebbs and flows of, of getting people connected to what, what's going to help them so it could, be, it could be very fluid it could be a lot of moving pieces and that's uh kind of the direction that i like to go for when we're we're looking at sitting down and meeting with someone or meeting with the family you want to you want to pick up the baton and go with that one dan <laughs> We'll, um, we'll give our, our parents a, a little break here. <laughs> so I, I think kind of the same thing, just to, to kind of piggyback off of it. I like what Thomas was saying, you know, um, encourage parents as well as self-advocates. Mm -hmm. um, give them the tools, um, kind of show them how to use it to keep that um, autonomy. Um, give them the opportunity to sort of pursue different things that they may need, may want, um, and then meeting them where they are um, in the process. So kind of figuring out where's the jumping off point, and then I guess kind of in the DDRC aspect, like if they come to us and they have, you know, struggles with homelessness, um, they're looking at the DD waiver, they're looking at school issues and that kind of thing, like sort of figuring out which one is more important, mm -hmm. which one do we need to really tackle right now, and then helping them connect with those resources um, so that we kind of wrap around them with, mm -hmm. with what we try and help out with instead of just focusing on any one specific issue, I guess. You're muted, Mandy. There you go. Oh, do you want me to go? Okay. Um, well, my experience has been um, that both personally and professionally that just giving um, exactly what everybody else said, yes, that encouragement and everything, but it's amazing how just saying you're doing a great job or find something that they really are doing something really good at because it's probably been a long time since they've heard that um, or, you know, just that positive reinforcement, right? It's not just good for kids. So, um, uh, bringing up the, what is going right and um and focusing on that and then you know if there are other things you know do you can do um you know let them know about other things that may may be available to them also knowing not um how much information is too much at any given time um but also allowing the the family to determine that as well. So um, 
I like to make sure and follow whatever I'm discussing with a family up in an email so they have a hard copy of what we talked about because a lot of times parents, um, their brains can get mushy when they're dealing with things that are have high emotion. So uh, following it up and saying, this is what we discussed. Also some things to consider, you know, are X, Y, and Z, and you know, that there are additional resources. And let me know when you're ready for that. And we can, you know, further discuss these other possibilities. Um, so um, kind of seeing what they need, but, um, I think above all, really, that positive reinforcement um, is is key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. I've met with a lot of parents or individuals, and, and they will express that they have no idea what they're doing, or are they even doing it correctly? And so it's, you are, you're definitely going in a good direction, and just giving them that reassurance that you are gaining some so yeah, thank you. And we'll follow up with Bree. Well, I think you guys have kind of uh, summed, it summed it up really well. <laughs> um, I do think that um, teaching self-advocacy is huge. We yeah. don't want, I, for me personally, I don't want someone to feel like they don't have power or control. You know, Provide them with those tools that they feel self-empowered. Um, you know, professionally as an advocate, you know, um, when parents would call, the biggest thing I could do was to be quiet, let them talk. Um, you know, I don't know everything. Um, I don't, mm -hmm. um, let them talk about what's going on. What's the emotion, you know, what are their thoughts? A lot of times I think just having someone to vent to, um, makes the biggest difference in the world, even if you can't really, there's no reason, you know, it, there's a certain situation where there's literally, they're doing everything possible and it's just a tough spot. Mm -hmm. um, and letting them know, like, like Mandy said, provide that positive reinforcement. You are doing everything you can do. Um, and, and being a listening ear. Um, and I, I think that Lisa, you're right too in terms of not bombarding them with service, you know, with resources because you can start drowning in all of these options. And where do I start first? And if you're already so overwhelmed and anxious and you're lost and you don't know what to do, sometimes if I get a list of, you know, a page that just lists out resources, I'm going to feel too overwhelmed to even, you know, try to decide who do I call first? Mm -hmm. What do I say to them? You know? Um, <clears throat> Uh, so just to, yeah, wrap things up. Actually, working with the lady right now, and currently that's the exact thing that's going on. I'm trying to encourage her to kind of do A, B, and C. She sends me her evaluation. I read it, and it's like one of the most comprehensive evaluations I've ever read. Um, but then I send her a message saying, you know, kind of here's step one, here's step two, here's step three. And now she is so overwhelmed with this email and what's going on that she's calling and saying, you know, can we, can we schedule a time where you can kind of go through this again with me and maybe simplify it a little bit. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of folks, it does become kind of overwhelming and they do need just to, okay, let's just work on step one today and then we can worry about the rest of this email next week. You know, let's start with one little thing and that's all we got to do. I thought the door, I thought the door, I'm like, oh no, it's going to get you Thomas, but we're good. <laughs> so we are at the end of our lunch and learn. So Fontana hopped off, Marcus hopped off, but ladies, thank you for being a part of our panel. This, this is awesome. It really is. Love hearing just the outside perspective of things.